بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله Start يا إسماعيل with the chapter جزاك الله خيرا and date the class بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Tonight on the 8th of Rabi al-Awwal in the year 1443 Corresponding to the 13th of October 2021, we are in the book Al-Wajiz, the concise presentation of the fiqh, in the chapter of foods on page 550, starting the subchapter, Sacrificial Animals. This refers to those animals that are slaughtered on the day of sacrifice and the days... Page, num- page number, what is it, please? In the English page book. number 550. No. Sacrificial Animals. This refers to those animals that are slaughtered on the day of sacrifice and the days of tashriq as a means of getting closer to Allah. Their ruling. Okay. Alhamdulillah wa salatu salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala. al here, the sacrificial animal, we do it because the Prophet ﷺ told us to do it. And before that, the Quran also had indicated that in Surah Al-Hajj. And... Allah Azza wa he says that the, the meat that you're sacrificing is not going to get to Allah. Allah doesn't need it. Only the taqwa, the piety, that means your piety will increase. And this is from the symbols of Islam, the Udhiya. And it's a revival of the sunnah of our father, the father of the old prophets, save of course Nuh alayhi salam and the ones who came before him, that is Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam when he wanted to slaughter his son, because he had seen that in his vision. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had uh, swapped that sacrificial for a ram. And that Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he had revived that sunnah. And this sunnah, we can't really find it, for example, in the uh, teachings of Ismail, Isa alayhi salam, or the teaching of Musa alayhi salam. So this is our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who had with Allah's, with the uh, permission from the Almighty Azza wa Jal to set this as a sunnah, which is the Udhiyah, to be sacrificed on the day of a Nahar, which is the 10th of the Dhul Hijjah, the last month of the Islamic year, and also the Tayyam al Tashriq, and that is the following three days, the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th. <laughs> We're going to see, inshallah, you know, later on the datings of that. So it is the Yawm al Nahar and the following three days. <coughs> the Ayam al Tashriq is called Ayam al Tashriq. They are the Tashriq, it means that uh, the um, Tashriq al Lahm. Before they used to slaughter and then the meat, they will put it onto the, into the sun by salting it uh, and treating it. And then this is how they used to preserve the meat. They didn't have the freezers. What is the rule of this Udhiyah? Before we talk about the rule of the Udhiyah, the Udhiyah is to be performed, as we said, on the day of Al-Adha and the following three days. <coughs> and on the day of the Adha, we perform Salatul Eid, Eid Al-Adha. And we have talked about Salatul Eid Al-Adha a long, long time ago when we said it is compulsory. Salatul Eid Al-Fitr or Salatul Eid Al-Adha, both Eid prayers. Eid al-Fitr, which comes after Ramadan, Eid al-Adha, which is on the 10th of the Hijjah. These two salah are to be compulsory. Now we know that there is three opinions regarding Salatul Eid. One, which says it is Sunnah. The other one, which says it is Fardu Kifaya. That means a collective obligation. What is a collective obligation? Meaning, if a group of people have done it, then there will be no sin on the rest of the Muslims. And the rest of the Muslims who reside in the same area, <coughs> or the same city, or the same country. And if nobody had done it, then everybody will be sinned. That's called collective obligation. Third one, fardu'ayn, individual obligation. And that is, it is obligatory, just like the Jumu'ah is obligatory, just like the normal four, five daily is obligatory. And this is the correct opinion that the Salat al Eid is to be, the prayer of the Eid, is to be obligatory. I don't know why I'm saying about the Salat al-Eid, we're talking about the Udhiyah, because it's going to link up now, because the, the, the Udhiyah itself, the sacrificial, it will take its obligation, or its rule, I should say, from the rule of the Salah. 
So if we establish the Salat al-Eid is to be obligatory, and this is the saying of our Sheikh al-Albani, and also our Sheikh ibn Uthami, may Allah have mercy upon them, and this is the choice of the, the as well, the choice of Sheikh ibn, ibn Baz, Sugar <coughs> al-Albani ibn Baz ibn Uthami, from the contemporary scholars, the recent ones, and also it is the choice of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, that the Eid prayer is to be uh, fardu'ayn, individual obligation. So let's talk now about the rule of the sacrificial on the day of Eid al-Adha and the following three days. Now, It's uh, their ruling. The sacrifice is obligatory upon the one who has the means. The okay. Prophet... Uh, he chosen obligatory, but this is not the scholars, you know, sort of have unanimous upon it. We have, as well regarding this issue, two sayings. One is, says it is sunnah, and one says it is obligatory. So you've got three sayings regarding the salah, two sayings, opinions regarding the udhiya. So it is either obligatory, which is individual obligation, or it is sunnah, means recommended. And some of them, they say highly recommended. Whether it's recommended or highly recommended, it's still, it's still the same. It's not obligatory. <laughs> the ones who said it is compulsory or obligatory, individual obligation, our Sheikh Al-Albani, our Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, not Sheikh Ibn Baz, though. Sheikh Ibn Baz, he chose only the Salah to be obligatory, but not the, uh, the sacrificial animal. And we believe that he's not correct. Um, the other scholars, they are more correct. And uh, the, also it is the choice of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. Now, as from the Jumhur, the scholars of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu, Imam uh, Malik, and Imam <clears throat> Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, believe it or not, that most of the scholars had said it is sunnah, it is not obligatory, which is the choice of Ibn Baz. The only scholar who had said that it is obligatory is Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa is the one who said obligatory. And I'm saying this just to, to show to these people who are all the time labeling us to be Hanbalis or uh, Wahhabis who don't really, or neglect Abu Hanifa. That's incorrect. Number of times the choice will be at Abu Hanifa. So it's not because we hate Abu Hanifa. So Abu Hanifa's choice regarding the sacrificial is to be obligatory. And this is the choice of Ibn Taymiyyah. And this is our the choice of Sheikh Al-Albani and also Sheikh Ibn Uthameen in comparison to the choice of Ibn Baz where he said it is sunnah, but it's actually obligatory. Here the author will bring what supports what he had chosen, which is the obligation of the sacrificial. Fadl. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever has the means but did not make the sacrifice should not approach our place of prayer. Okay. Now you, you know why I brought the... Uh, rule regarding the salah because he says here man kana lahu sa'a who's got enough money to produce an old here and he did not make a sacrificial should not approach our musallah then he should not pray with us go ahead the reasoning here is that since he prohibited the one uh since he prohibited the one with the means to perform the sacrifice from coming close to the place of prayer if he did not make the sacrifice that means that he has left something which is obligatory. It is as if there is no benefits for coming closer to Allah by means of the prayer for the one who did not perform this obligation. So, uh, so, so, so you understand now. So if coming to the prayer of Salat al-Eid is obligatory. Now I think my microphone is switching now from one side to another. That's the problem. Lord Mustan. Okay, uh, if it keeps switching, please tell me because I, I, it's playing. Play. So, basically, uh, if we know that Salatul Eid is obligatory, and if I don't really sacrifice my Eid al Adha, I cannot come to Salatul Eid al Adha. So, what makes Salatul Eid al Adha? It's like, I cannot pray without wudu. So the wudu becomes compulsory for my salah. I cannot pray until I make wudu. If, I don't, if I'm not on tahara, purity, so purification for salah is compulsory. Same thing here for coming to the Eid al-Adha 
and it's a must upon you to make Eid al-Adha, just like a must upon you to do the prayer, then it's a must upon you too as well to sacrifice. Because if you don't sacrifice the Prophet, he said, don't even approach our Musalla, not just to come to the Salah, don't even join. If, as long as you have what? Uh, enough money uh, uh, to sacrifice. Here, and the following hadith, Fadl. Mughnaf ibn Sulaim said, we were staying with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at Arafah and he said, O people, every household must make a sacrifice and atira every year. Do you know what atira is? It is what the people call sacrifice of the month of Rajab. The atira sacrifice has been abrogated as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there is no far'ah or atira in Islam. The abrogation of Atira does not mean that the sacrifice is also abrogated. Okay. Dun Every time you finish something before you start on the hadith, just pause. So we have here Mikhnaf telling us that we were with the Prophet in Arafah. And the Prophet he said, O oh people, and that is on the day of Arafah, there is on every household, in every people, on every family, in every year, an udhiyah and atirah. Now, the atirah, which is the one to be performed in Rajab, they call it a Rajabiya. The atirah was abrogated. And the abrogation came from the following hadith, which is لا فرع ولا عتيرة. No فرع and no atirah. We understand the atirah now, the sacrificial, which is in Rajab. It's abrogated, abolished. It's not there. So still the odd hit. What is the fara, by the way? The fara is actually the first production, the first birth from camels or sheep. The, the jahiliya, the pre-Islamic people, they used to slaughter that uh, fara, which is the first production, the first cup comes from the sheep or comes from the, uh, comes from the uh, camels. They sacrifice it to their idols or they sacrifice it if their camels or their sheep had reached a hundred in sort of number. So they reach a hundred, they say, Khalas, we have to slaughter now. Uh, we have to slaughter a camel uh, every year. And then when they slaughter it, they don't eat from it. Him or his household or his family cannot eat from that. So Islam came and abolished this. There is no such thing when your camel reached a hundred. Then you slaughter a camel every year and you don't eat from that camel, nor that it is that uh, uh, every time that there is, a, well, you slaughter for the idols because Allah Azza wa Jal, he came to abolish all these idols and statues. So, la fara, la atira. So, we got left now with what? The old here. Jundub. Jundub ibn Sufyan al, al Bajali said, I witnessed the Prophet وسلم, on the day of sacrifice, and he said, Whoever sacrificed before the prayer must repeat it with another in its place. One who has not yet sacrificed should perform the, should perform the sacrifice. The apparent meaning implies obligation, especially since there is an order to repeat the act. Okay. So this is an obvious hadith to tell us that this sacrificial is to be obligatory. Because if the Prophet of Allah, he said, if you have made your sacrificial before the prayer, then let him compensate and make another sacrificial after the prayer of the Eid. If it was Sunnah, then there is no obligation upon you to slaughter. So if you slaughtered it before, it will be becoming like a normal, you know, a normal just meat or sadaqah. But here the Prophet of Allah he said, if you want to do that for the Eid, if you did it before the Eid, it's not going to be sufficing. You have to redo it, okay? Redo it after the Salat al-Eid. And then after that, he said, And he who doesn't, if he didn't slaughter anything, whether it's before or, you know, then let him slaughter after. So the one who did not slaughter, let him slaughter. That's a, a knockout, I should say. This hadith is muttafaq ali, okay? But you can ask the question, why these scholars, like Sheikh Ibn Baz said, it is, not compulsory, it is sunnah. And why the other scholars as well, like Imam Shafi, because, because of number of narrations there, which it is not gonna be strong enough to oppose this. One of them, for example, Abu Bakr and Umar, during the reign of Khilafah, they did not slaughter their sacrificial. 
Okay, and that can be reinterpreted. Number one, at Abu Bakr and Umar, that doesn't mean they are going to be strong enough to oppose the hadith of the Prophet. Maybe they didn't know. Number two, another reason it could be that normally the Imam, when he does the khutbat al Eid, he will sacrifice in the Musalla itself. So the sacrificial of the people will be after the sacrificial of the Imam. And because of the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, this is documented in history. That people used to boast about how many sacrificial they do. So instead of sacrificing one sheep, it sacrificed two or three to boast. So boasting was not really correct. And, and, and it became now it's not really a uh, sort of uh, thing to do with ibadah, it's to do with extravagance. So Abu Bakr and Umar, maybe for that reason, they did not slaughter in front of everybody. Because the hadith doesn't say that they did not slaughter, they mean they did not slaughter in the musalla. That's what the narration regarding Abu Bakr and Umar, which makes it really still standing that the slaughtering here, if you don't really slaughter, don't come to the Salah. If you haven't slaughtered, then slaughter. And also that if you slaughtered before the Salah, then let you repeat it. All of that indicating the compulsory. There's more to that. And if you look at that into the Rwa al Ghalil, uh, he will tell you about the rule of this. <coughs> and it used to be compulsory. One of the hadith as well, hadith Abi Hurairah. Ala ahli kulli baytin fi kulli amin udhiya. For every year, there is on every household family, then there is an udhiya to sacrifice. So this one is a general, of course, but it is being tied up by the other hadith, which is that if you have a sa'a, if you have a sa'a, I mean, that means you are capable of producing the udhiya. Also, the udhiya becomes compulsory on the poor in the case that he had made a vow. So he said, a vow upon me. Allahi Nadrun, Nadr means a vow, Nazar, call it Nazar in, in Pakistani, Urdu. Uh, that is, I'm going to make a, a sacrificial uh, in, uh, in the Eid al Adha. So even if he's poor, he has to do it. becomes compulsory upon him because he is the one who made it compulsory upon him. <laughs> this person, regarding is he capable or not to produce the Udha, becomes compulsory upon him, is to be judged on the days of Al Adha and the following day. So if he was poor. <coughs> he was not intended to make Udhiya, but yet he, suddenly he became rich. He received his inheritance from such and such place, from a, a relative he didn't know about. And he received a lot of money, which is enough to produce an Udhiya, whether it's on the Eid al-Adha or any day from the following three days before it finishes, then it becomes compulsory upon him to produce the Udhiya. This Udhiya is only compulsory on the person who is the household master which is the man okay the husband is the one who is the the uh, the breadwinner they call him the one who is the, the the father so he is the man who is in charge of the house he is the one to produce the udhiya and if he's got if he's poor and his wife is rich the udhiya is not compulsory again if the husband is poor and the wife is rich she's a multimillionaire the udhiya is not compulsory it has to be the husband. But if she had given, you know, as a present to her husband some money, he became rich. Uh, uh, and also, it is not correct for the wife that if her husband had made an udhya to make an udhya. That's not correct. We don't want to have a competition between the wife and the husband. So if she's got her own money, okay, she's not correct to go and make an udhya. It's not going to be uh, received properly by the husband. It's not going to be welcoming that. So the husband is, has to be the master. So he will produce the Udhiya. So uh, this is uh, something to understand. Now, if you have a son uh, or a daughter who are outside your house, so let's the, the, the Udhiya is enough for you and the family, but you have a son who is independent, okay? And this son lives with you in one house he's got enough money he's got his own sources of money but he lives in the same house then uh, uh, then that old here will suffice no problem about that but if he is to be in a different place different floor different uh, accommodation then the, the son will become uh, having compulsory upon him to make his old here if the father is poor and the son is rich, the father is considered rich. 
again, regardless where the son lives. So if the father is poor, it is no odhiya on him. But the son is rich, it becomes compulsory on the father because the father is considered to be rich. Unless the father, you know, he has no connection whatsoever with the son and the son is not really basically uh, uh, giving any sort of consideration to his father. But in Islam, because the Prophet ﷺ said, You and your money belongs to your father because the father of yours is the one who manufactured you, uh, giving birth to you after the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the son is rich. The father is considered to be rich straight away. So this, the father would say to his son, bring me some money. I want to sacrifice an animal. So he will sacrifice his own sacrificial and the son will do his sacrificial because it's a different accommodation. So, but if they are, Three conditions here. If they, the son is in the same accommodation, so it's the same place where he is, and it is that he, they are joining the food together, okay? So they are in one nafaqa. And the third reason, which is that the person, he is his son, so he's got relationships. So the relationship is a son. So it's not, it, it doesn't work, for example, if you had your neighbor living with you, who is not related to you, or your servant living. That's not to do with that, Okay. It's not to do with this. It has to be a relationship like the father and the son. And it has to be as well in the same place and the same, now you know, food and all of that together. They are eating together. Then the one sacrificial of the father will be sufficient for the independent son who lives with him. As for the daughter, daughter, she's living on her own. Again, if she's got her husband, then her husband is the one who's in charge. He has nothing to do with her father. Okay. Now the question is, what about if the woman, she's a single mother. And if she had a son, old son, it would become incumbent upon him to make the old here. But what about she has in her own, okay, on her own, and she is the one running the, the house and she's got children. Is there an old here? Uh, that's a controversial amongst the scholars, the correct opinion that she she is as well because she is uh, uh, rich enough to make the udhiya of Allah Ta'ala alam, so then the the hadith encompass her uh, or because Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he made it incumbent upon the women to come to Salat al-Eid Salat al-Eid is compulsory not just on the men on the females okay even the one who's got her menses she comes just to witness the gathering the celebration she does not participate in the prayer but it is incumbent upon the hadith of radiallahu anha but the Prophet of Allah, he said, he had commanded them to bring out every person, even Al-Mukhabba, the hidden girl. He's never seen anybody, just in his all the time with her. You know, she's she's in her bedroom. She only comes out when she gets married. Al-Mukhabba, wal bikr the virgin, all of that. Uh, it, it is not uh, compulsory to make an udhiya on the person who is dead. So if your son or your father, let's say your father is son, to, to, to make an udhi on him, no, it's not, this is not correct, to make a, an independent sacrificial for him. Unless the person who died, your father or your son, had left a will, that is, I left some money, and I want that money to be used, some of it, to be sacrificing an animal every year. So you're fulfilling the will. So the will is no problem, but we cannot do it just like without a will, and start to make a sacrificial for the dead person. The udhiyah cannot be combined with the aqiqah in one sacrificial. So if you have a son which is born, let's say, six days, seven days before the Eid al-Abha, so you want to take this opportunity, you slaughter your udhiyah, and this is considering for your daughter that she's born as a aqiqah, you know, it doesn't work. Aqiqah on its own, and udhir its own. So the animal cannot take and fulfill to here obligation because the aqiqah is also as well an obligation. Oh, of course, there's a difference among the scholars, but it does not, cannot be included in your udhir. The udhir is different. Uh, now, if the person, he was set to hajj, hajj during the days of the hijjah it's going to make his Umrah, it's going to make his Hajj, of course, starting from the 8th of the Hijjah. So when he goes there, there's a Hadi on him. Is there any Udhiyah on him? Yes, there is an Udhiyah on him. So there's an Udhiyah and there's a Hadi. So even if he's going there. So again, this microphone just can switch it now. 
it's not. It's coming back now. Bye. So the person who goes to, let's say, Hajj, and he left his wife and his children, he goes to Hajj, and then he makes Hajj Tamattu'a. He has to make the Hadi. Hadi is a sacrificial animal. That sacrificial animal is for him, but he also has to arrange for an Udhiya to be slaughtered where his family is. If he can't, he could just do it then where he is in Saudi Arabia. No problem about that. But the Udhiya is better to be because there's some scholar they said you have to eat from the Udhiya, like Shia Salah al Fuzam. Um, this is a Sunnah to eat, to make it where you are, as we're going to come to it, inshallah. So the, but the, we need to know that to make understand this. Let's say, for example, part of your family stayed and part of family went with you. Okay. So the, the ones who went with you for the Hajj, each one he needs a Hadi. Okay. Whereas the Udhiya is for all of them. So one Udhiya is for the whole, including yourself. And the Hadi is for each individual who's making Hajj. Let's continue, inshallah. Jazakumullah. What animals qualify for the sacrifice? The sacrificial animal can only be a camel, sheep or goat, or a cow. Allah has said, And for every nation, we have appointed religious ceremonies that they may, that they may mention the name of Allah over the beast of cattle that he has given them for food. Okay, behemoth al-an'am, it doesn't mean anything that walks on four, as Ibn Hazm had said. Al-an'am is either camels, cows, or sheep, or the likes. Camels, there is uh, uh, as well, similar to the camels in some of the countries, I don't know what they call it. Um, and also the cows, there is the buffaloes, okay, they are similar to the cows as well. And the sheep, they are well, similar to the sheep as well. Some of them is called, I can't remember the names of them, but from that category, okay? So the regardless of the sheep looks like tall or small, or that's a sheep. Whether it's black or white, that's a sheep. And as for the cows, well, there's a buffalo, big, buff, big cow, small cow, big toro, big uh, bull, that's, uh, that's the, the cows issue. And the camels as well, okay? Uh, this is well camels, and there is short camels in some of the countries, smaller camels, smaller size, double hump, one hump, three humps, all of the camels. It is not allowed to have it in definitely in rabbits or chicken or birds. Okay. And also it is not allowed into something which is more expensive than the camel, like the horse. The horse is allowed for you to eat it. Uh, the Kazakhstan's people there, they love, they love this horse. The people come from the southern part of Russia. They love to eat the horse. And the horse is halal. But the horse, even it's more expensive than the camel some, sometimes, but it's not allowed to have. So it's not going to be sufficing. It's not going to be acceptable if you slaughter the camel. It has to be one of the three categories. Camels, cows, or sheep. Now. A camel or cow suffices for how many people? Ibn Abbas said, We were traveling with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the time of the sacrifice came. Ten of us would share in one camel and seven of us would share in one cow. Right. This is controversial. So he's, he's choosing here the hadith which is that the camels is for ten and the sheep are for seven. And, uh, sorry, the cow for seven. As for the sheep, is only for one. <coughs> so sheep for one. Now here when we say one, we're talking about one family. He could be one on his own, or he could be one with his wife, or he could be one with his four wives. <coughs> so this person has got four wives and a hundred children. One sheep is enough for all of them. No idea. Okay? So whether it's one on his own, or one with four wives and hundred children. One other is enough. It's not for each wife. So it's only one. <coughs> As for the cow, that's most of the scholars. They say seven. Because hadith, seven. The cow is seven. That means I could share seven families. So those families, it could be each one with you know four wives and a hundred children. So you got about, I don't know, you got about 700 people. 
a thousand people it doesn't matter it has to be so it's enough for seven families okay and as for the camel the camel differs scholars are different about it is it enough for 10 most of the scholars they say seven <coughs> because of the hadith of jabir radiallahu anh. but this hadith of abdullah ibn abbas is it clear that the camels is enough for 10. now it's very important to understand when we share that the sharing has to be done on the on the on the on the on the time when we decide so let's say for example we were three families decided to share a cow so we got mashallah still spare for four so if we decided and we have appointed the cow to slaughter it there is no way for other three or four to, to make the seven to come and can we just mix ourselves with you and share it no it has to be set one go so we share together and then we'll say we'll go to the cow not to make the decision for the cow as three families or four families and then later on we find other families to join in no no joining in because we are appointed ourselves so you have to be first of all the agreement and then go to choose the cow or the camel the camel as we said most of the scholars say seven but the hadith here is clear if it's authentic alhamdulillah <coughs> that's enough for 10 families the camel enough for 10 families but in hadi in hadi which is for the hajj we said the sheep is for one definitely for both sides whether it's hadi or odhia cow is seven for both sides whether it's odhia or hadi but for the camel it's only seven so a camel for the odhia there is a, there is a narration here which is makes it ten ten families can share but in the hadi <coughs> only seven and seven individuals not seven families remember in the heavy individuals shares not families so if i've got for example let's say that remember the example of four wives and 100 children imagine that this man he traveled with his four wives and his 100 children and he made hajj okay so he needs a truck of uh, you know of sheep okay because each one of them has to have a sheep or they could suck so they could share each seven in a camel or seven in a cow okay they could share share but not the whole family just like the odd here the old here there's only one sheep for them which is better this is not here by the way which is better to sacrifice is it the sheep or the camel or the cow which is for the odd here the best one of course is the camel so if you sacrifice a camel for your family it's better no sharing here after that cow after that the sheep after the sheep comes one tenth of the camel after that one seventh of the cow so this is that the order which one is better so if i've got the money i'll buy a camel for my family and sacrifice if i don't cow even if i've got a lot of money i could go to the sheep but i'm just saying which is best they're going to go to the sheep then after the sheep seven uh, one tenth of the camel better than the one seventh of the cow okay then which one is better in the sheep sheep is the better is that the white better than the black better than the use the nice use e w -A -S, yeah use so the the sheep the category of the sheep where you got the lamb and all of that is better than the use and also the male is preferable to the female so if you have a male sheep or a male ewe is more it is better to, to slaughter than the female okay and by the way if anybody says why all the time you give preference to the male not the female well this time we prefer him to slaughter him not to save him so we're saving the female okay um also the preference goes to the uh, uh, big the big to the uh to the small so or the more the chubby it is the better it is and the, the one with the horns which is would be better as well and the, if it is white from the sheep it's better so it's better than the one which got black because the prophet ﷺ, he had slaughtered two rams big ones and 
they were actually had their testicles removed because it would make it even chubbier. As we're going to see which one is fit, inshallah, in a minute to, to slaughter regarding the teeth and all of that and the horns and the eyes and the legs. So the um, Prophet he chose these two rams and the hadith says that they were white, but they've got four locks. The feet are black. Around his eyes, there's black. It's like he's like having a, an eyeliner, subhanAllah. The more beautiful your other hair it is, the better and closer to Allah it will be. So the more expensive it is, basically. Fadl. A sheep slash goat suffices for one man and his household. Aqa ibn Yasar said, I asked, Abu, I asked Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, how was the sacrifice among you during the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah? He said, during the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man would sacrifice a sheep on his behalf and on behalf of his household. He would eat from it and feed others. Then the people start to boast and things become as you see them now. And that was the continuation of the of continuation of this hadith when Umar Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr and Umar, they did not slaughter outside because the people started to boast. And boasted is not correct. But am I allowed to slaughter though more than one sheep for my old hair? You're allowed as long as you're not doing it for the boasting. Fayyib, we need to, to talk about the, the cutting of the nail, which is not here. When the person has enough money to produce an udhiyah, the udhiyah becomes compulsory upon him, we said. Prophet Sallallahu he said, إِذَا هَلَّ ذِي هِلَالُ ذِي الْحِجَّةِ When the hilal of the hijjah starts to the month indicating the beginning of the month of the hijjah, which is the night before the first of the hijjah. If we sight the moon and you have an udhiyah to sacrifice, that means it's compulsory upon you to sacrifice the udhiyah, then do not cut from the nails nor from the hair anywhere nor peeling off the skin. Three things you can't do then. Cut the nails, whether it's from the hands or the, the foot, the toes, or cut the hair from anywhere, whether it's from the beard, from the head, from the pubic hair, from the underarms, can't cut hair. And the third one, you cannot peel off the skin. So you can't even, even if you have been circumcised, you're not allowed to circumcise. This is only for the person who's in charge. It's nothing to do with his wife. Nothing to do with his children is only the one whom the udhiyah is compulsory upon him. The rest of the family could do whatever they like. If you became rich within the first 10 days of hijjah, so you start abstaining from all of that once you become rich, once you become the udhiyah compulsory upon you. So if you did not plan to make the udhiyah and we said you know, inherited somebody on the fifth of the hijjah, you start from there and you abstain from there. From the uh, from all of that that I've just said, which is they said the nails, hands and toes, and also the hair anywhere, and also peeling off the skin. If you did that, you forgot, you cut your nail, whatever, no problem. Your old hair is okay. And he who done that out of necessity, then no problem, inshallah. So, if, for example, he's he's got illness and he's got lice. Okay, he has to, you know, do to cut his hair to get the lice. No problem, inshallah. So there is nothing wrong with him. Um, also, the one who has to do it for specific for their ibadah, which is, let's say that this person he is going for Hajj, and he's going to make now his Umrah, and he made his Umrah within the first ten days of the Hijjah, and he has got as well udhi to do, apart from the Hadith. There's an udhi. So you know that when you finish your Umrah, in order to, to make this tamattu'ah, you have to cut your hair, okay? To cut the hair in order to finish the Umrah. So you're allowed in that case, even you have an udhiyah, to do that because you have to do it before the 8th of the Hijjah to do your, your Umrah. So if you, you're allowed now to cut the hair in order to make tahallul from the Umrah, but not anything else, not the nails, not the peeling of the skin. That has to be done after you slaughter your old hair. If you slaughter it on the 10th, then you start doing that. Okay? But you know for a fact as well, you're going to state it, you're going to be already uh, in the 8th of the Hijjah, you're going to be in the state of the Haram for the Hajj. You're not allowed anyway to cut the hair or cut the nails. So, 
uh, and you have to abstain until you finish your hajj and then you will cut. Now, if you did that deliberately, you cut the hair or you cut the nails or you peeled off the skin, uh, your udhi is still accepted, but you'll be sinned because you have committed a prohibition. طيب. The udhiyah is not allowed to be given as money. So people think that, I, well, the udhiyah cost me 200 pounds. Let me just give 200 pounds to poor people. No. Udhiyah has to be slaughtered. This is a symbol of Islam. It cannot be done like this. It cannot be done by giving the charity. And I mean, you will say, is anybody who do that? Yeah, there is. And I've heard him with my own ears. He said, I don't mind giving a fatwa to the people to say to them that instead of giving you know, the meat, because the pe people, they're not going to do anything with the meat, to give them money. A'udhu billah. Sacrificial. This is all here, symbol. We have to do it. What is not permissible as a sacrificial animal? Rubaid ibn Fayruz said, I said to Al-Barra ibn Azib, tell me about what is disliked or prohibited by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the sacrificial animal. He said, the Master of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went like this with his hand, and my hand is smaller than his, and said, four types of animals are not sufficient for the sacrifice. He did like this, four. Now. A one-eyed animal that is obviously one-eyed, a sick animal which is obviously ill, a lame animal with an obvious limp, and an old animal that has no marrow and is extremely lean and skinny. And he said, I hate that there should be some shortcoming in the ear. He said, what I dislike of them, leave them, but I do not make them forbidden for anyone. Continue, please. Finish all the things. A small milking goat of less than one year is not suitable for the sacrifice. Al-Barra ibn Azib said, one of my maternal uncles called Abu Burda sacrificed before the prayer. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, the sheep you slaughtered is just the, sh is, is just the sheep for meat. Okay, can, that, can you just say to me, please, there's, a, there's something there missing in my book here, in your, on your book. Can you read, please, from where it's the last one in that first hadith, hadith Ubaid ibn Fayruz, the last bit it says there, and the one which is, you know, thin. After that, what does it say? And he said, I hate that there should be some shortcoming in the ear. He said, what I dislike of them, leave them, but I, but I do not make them forbidden for anyone. Okay. I'll just, I'll just wait here and I'll, 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 I'll continue better. Good. So this is now to do with the sheep. And then later on we'll talk about then the age. What is not permissible? Hadith of the Prophet is clear here. He said, four things you're not allowed to have them as a sacrificial. You could have them aqiqa when we talk about aqiqa, but not in the udhiyah. One of them, which is al-awra, al-bayyinu awaruha. Awra, that means it's got one eye. Where her, you know, it is obvious for a person to see that she got one eye. I don't need to take, to take her to the, uh, to, you know, spec savers and, and check her eyes. No, the one you could see 100%, she's one eye. She can't see with, except for one eye. I'm not allowed to do that. Secondly, she's ill and her illness can show properly. Okay, المريضة. المريضة هي, يعني, you could say that she's, she's moving in a way. Thirdly, the one who's limping, so that is broken foot to her, so she cannot do that. And the fourth one, which is the one which has got no brain, she can't distinguish between water and dirt. Okay, she cannot distinguish between the two. These are the four things which are mentioned in the hadith, but there are other things which are mentioned from the Prophet Sallallahu Hadith Ali Ibn Talib, he had added as well things. So let's just make sure that the, we understand. As for the ears, we are not allowed, he says here, as for the ears, basically, this has nothing to do with the Prophet Sallallahu when he just said, by the way, that in the, I hate that something which is deficient in the ear. This is to do with Ubaid ibn, uh, Bara ibn Azim. The ears, we say that um, if this ear uh, is little bit, like for example, sometimes they uh, clip the ear for numbers or 
uh, for marking, okay, that's no problem. But if most of the ear is gone because it's going to affect the meat, it's not correct. It cannot use it. Or you cannot as well use the one which is, has been born without ears. You cannot choose that as well. Okay, so this says as well, because anything that would affect the meat, because the ears of meat is not allowed. So also, the one which has got the tongue cut, you're not allowed. Or something which is born with no foot or no, you know, it's born with something which is a deficiency in it, we're not allowed. Also, al-jalala. Jalala is an, the animal which is that it always eats the excrement, eats the dead animals. You know, it's been eating you know, the poo and all of this. It becomes jalala. And we talked about the jalala when we talked about purification. This jalala from the sheep and the camels and the cows, we're not allowed to eat them until we purify them. How to purify them? We lock them up at least for three, four days just to make sure that they eat the healthy food because that food that they eat affects the meat. Now we're coming to the other issues which does not really affect. The testicles, no, no problem, because the, 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 when they remove the testicles, actually, the sheep goes fat. And as I said, the Prophet he had um, castrated animals. Uh, he had actually uh, made the odhiya with them. As for the one, for the got no teeth, no problem. You don't have to take it to the dentist, so no problem about that. As for the one who's got no horns or the horn is broken, no problem. So even the horn has been really pulled out of their body, no problem, because it does not affect the meat. Now we're coming to the age. Father. A small milking goat of less than one year is not suitable for the sacrifice. Al-Barra ibn Azib said, one of, my, one of my maternal uncles called Abu Burda sacrificed before the prayer. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, the sheep you slaughtered is just the sheep for meat. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have a small milking goat of less than one year. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Slaughter it, and it will not be appropriate for anyone other than you. Then he said, whoever slaughtered before the prayer has slaughtered for himself. Whoever slaughtered after the prayer has completed the rites and was in accord with the practice of the Muslims. Okay, well, um, these categories for each of, of those animals, we have the sheep, we have the goats, the sheep is the white and the goats, which is the ewes and all of that. And we have as well camels and we have cows. So we have something called jada, and we have something which is called musin. Al jada is the one you said milk, milked one, the milky, you know, the one which is really young. The jada from the sheep is allowed. And the thani from the ma'is is is the one which is allowed. So what is the jadha? Jadha from the button, they, they differed about the age. Lots of sort of uh, difference about what is the age. Definitely if it's white, if it's one year, no problem. Mashallah. But less than one year, that's where the difference among the scholars. This depends upon the expertise because he will see how much, how big it is. You know, here, for example, sheep was seven, eight months. Mashallah, it's like a bull, very big here. But less than six months, that's not allowed. So the white, the sheep, less than six months, is not allowed. Above six months, the expert had to look. And you see, if it's really big, got meat, no problem. But if it is above one year, alhamdulillah, that's uh, going to be big enough. Uh, I remember one day when we had Udhiya, we had brought some sheep from the, uh, from, the, from the farm. We brought about seven. And one of them, I was really in doubt of it. So I phoned the, my, my friend who is an expert. He sells and buys and it was in, and he was in a different country. And at that time, there was no, no video link. There was no, like, I can't take pictures. There was no WhatsApp at that time. So I called him and I said to him, this sheep, and I'm not really sure about it. So it looks like very small. And he said to me, the wool on it, you know, the white wool, is it combed or is it like, point, like pointed end, pointed end? I said, it looks like pointed end. He said, it's not allowed. That means it's, it's less than six, six months. And he learned that from Sheikh Ibn Uthimi, rahimahullah. 
Alhamdulillah, we did not make it as an udhiyah, we used it as a, for cooking, for food. The person who had bought the Jazal he took it. So the pointed end, so the, the, this comb is pointed end, that shows you how young it is. So this is an expert. But, you know, normally these big ones are, mashallah, they fit enough. As for the goats, the goats, two years. But it's allowed from one year above if it's the goat is filled. Exactly the same thing we said, the sheep, one year. But it's allowed six months and above as long as it is filled. Less than six months is not allowed. The goats, two years. It's allowed from one year if it's big. Less than one year is not allowed. So goats, less than one year is not allowed. Sheep, less than six months is not allowed. But remember, if you're above six months and less than one year, it has to be filled. The goats above one year, less than two years, has to be filled. As for the cows, it has to be two years minimum. The camel has to be five years minimum. Those are the called the uh, the uh, uh, the able thani. Wallahu alam. So we, we have to understand that, you know, when you buy camels and all that, you have to understand who you're going to buy from. An expert who will tell you. And they will tell you even, the, the, you know, the age of it by looking at their teeth. Uh, we, now we're just going to uh, make sure that we fill all the gaps regarding this issue. Uh, some people, they give some meat to the Prophet ﷺ. That's incorrect. Um, some people and how do you distribute the meat how do you distribute the meat now distributing the meat you have to understand that some of the scholars they said it's compulsory for you to eat from the meat and that is not really a strong opinion but it's very sunnah to eat from your odhia. Uh, to, to you could take from it and it you give to the poor the more you give to the poor the, the more rewardable you are and give as well hadiyah give to your friends to your relatives, so you give to your friends, to your relatives, <clears throat> to yourself and your family, and most of the poor, but it is not really to be divided into like three parts exactly the same, which is one part for yourself, one part for your relatives, and one part for the poor, the outsiders. That's incorrect. <coughs> but if you did it like for the three categories without you know, making sure that they're really the same, exactly, because some people are fussy about that, yeah, so it's not really to be really fussy about this has to be exactly that's not a sunnah. But you can do the three parts, no problem, as the Prophet said, Kulu wa dakhiru wa Um can I save from the meat? Yes, for yourself you could save. It's for you. But if the meat, if you want to give it to other people, don't save it more than three days unless there is no poor. If there's poor people. And you want to give to the poor people, don't save it for more than three days and give it to them because they want it. Uh, how can I slaughter an udhiya on behalf of my son who is independent without him knowing? No. So if my son is independent and he is, or anybody person who is independent, <coughs> is not related to you, and you want to make an udhiya on him as a hadiyah, gift, you want to pay it, and you say, this is on behalf of so-and-so, my son or my relative, my cousin, my friend. If he did not give the consent, it will not work. It will not be sufficing. He has to make his order here. You have to make, it to, to make another one. So you have to take to call him to tell him that I'm going to make an order on your behalf. I'm going to pay for my own money and do it. If he accepts, khalas, he doesn't have to pay money and get another order here. The timing for the order here, we said, is after Salat al-Eid. Unless the Imam slaughters in the Musalla, then it's after the Imam slaughters. Until the sunset of the third day after the Eid. So you've got four days, Eid al-Adha, the following three days, until the sunset of the third day after Eid al-Adha. Uh, this is from the Sunnah. That is you slaughtered the Udhaya. Now we've talked about you know, the slaughtering, but it's from the from Udhaya, from the Sunnah, it is for you to slaughter yourself. It is the Sunnah. But you could as well give somebody else to slaughter. Remember, with this condition for the person to uh, <coughs> slaughter, <coughs> can be a Christian, no problem, Christian or a Jew, as long as it's disliked. Okay. <coughs> 
none other than the Christian, the Jew. Um, so if you, to make an appointed, give the power of attorney, sorry, if you deputize somebody else, it's better to be a Muslim. Uh, if you have slaughtered and you found a, a baby sheep inside the, you know, the, the female, you slaughtered a female, then slaughtering of the mother is will be considered to be slaughtering for that, that cub, okay, inside her womb. Unless he was born alive, then you have to slaughter him. Okay, unless he was born alive, then you have to slaughter him. Uh, we've talked about saying Bismillah when we talked about this. Alhamdulillah. Okay, inshallah. So we stop here, inshallah. The aqiqah will be uh, in two weeks' time, bi because leave the questions now, bi for the udhiyah. Go ahead for another 10, 15 minutes, bi Allah. Naam. Jazakumullah khairan, Shaykh. My brothers and sisters, raise your hands for your questions, priorities for Ellsbury. Please ask on topic questions. Wait for off topic. Jazakumullah khairan. Sisters, you can send the question on the chat. Questions admin one. Go ahead, Faisal. Priority goes to send to Aylesbury, Akhwan. Now. For a camel or a cow, is it 10 shares or 7 shares for Udhiyah? What is the maximum can someone do in, a ter in terms of shares for a cow or camel? I think you've joined maybe late. That's why we've talked about it thoroughly. Oh, I'm sorry, Sheikh. I, I did step away for a few minutes. So I apologize if this was not. We, really we have really discussed it thoroughly. We talked about it. And uh, I cannot, because there's a lot lot of things to do with the difference among the scholars and all of that, but we could say Udhiyah is 10 uh, for the uh, Udhiyah is 10 people for the camel. But uh, if you want to understand more about the difference among the scholars, please uh, rewind and see it again. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah Go ahead, Anas. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, in terms of uh, when it is prohibited for, for the one in charge to not cut nails and hair and everything. If he combs his hair and a lot of hair pull out from the comb, is that considered? No problem. No, no problem, Michelle. No problem, Michelle. Exactly. Yeah, Zach. Zach Malawi and Ubaid. Ubaid, if you put Aylesbury, then remember they, they'll give priority. But if you put Ubaid, he doesn't know. <laughs> uh, it's an effort to change. Inshallah. <laughs> uh, Sheikh, if, uh, for instance, uh, if the meat is, uh, if you store a meat, if you don't give any away and you keep all of it, is that a sin or is it, uh, you, you have it to? It is acceptable. It the order is acceptable, but the more you give, the more reward. It's not going to be a sin. But you definitely, you're not giving because you don't find anybody. But there is, you could just give gifts. You could give gifts. And by the way, you could give even disbelievers. No problem. So if he's a person who is a, you know, you could really, through that udhiya, you could bring him to the deen. You could bring him to the deen. That's another question as well. So if your neighbor is a Christian, you could give him part of that udhiya to him. As a hadith, you give him like a, uh, you know, something. I have given one leg, whole lamb to my leg, to my neighbor here, Christian. And uh, <laughs> she said to me, I don't know how to cook it. Uh, I thought of you, everybody, you know, I could just give it to you, you could marinate it for her. Leg and lamb, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> leg lamb, a whole leg lamb, big, big lamb, leg lamb. Uh, another no. another, th another question, no. basically, if uh, you live in the same house and all the children, you know, they're all working, but not married, do they all have to do it individually? or well, what, uh, Did you join in as well late or did you join from the beginning? No, I did join from the beginning. Sorry, I was... Uh... Maybe one did the kitchen. Uh, he started cooking. Basically, we said that the person, uh, if he's fulfilling three conditions, he is a relative of his, like his son, and he is under his, you know, like he's the one who's spending on the food, he's, he's within the expenditure of the man, and he's in one house, then once sacrificial is enough. So if your son is your son, that's number one, conditions gone there. Number two, he is eating from the house, He's not having his own independence food for himself and he buys it, but actually the father provides it. The third one is that they are in the, under one roof. It's not a different floor. Then that sacrificial will suffice in the shelf. sister wants to know if llamas or, I don't know what it is, is alpacas count as camels? Llamas are camels. We know that. I don't know what is the other one. Google it. Barakallahu feekum. 
Uh, sister wants to know if she can sacrifice abroad and donate that meat to the poor. Sacrifice the old hay abroad is no problem. We said that some of the scholars like Sheikh Buzani said if you do it abroad, you don't eat from it, it's not going to be sufficing. But this is incorrect. We say the sunnah is to do it. And plus, you do it where you are, even if you don't have poor. But you could do two. One for the poor outside, like you said, and one for here. I wanted to, I mean, you take your children if you can, where there's a slaughtering there, so they could really practice their religion and see it. That's the best thing, inshallah. Assalamualaikum. Anas, you have another question, Habibi? No, if nobody else is there, I have an off topic question. Is that okay? Is that better to say, Akhi, Akhi, not Habibi, Ahmed? No, I'm fine. Habib is for your wife. Naam. Naam. Um, Sheikh, you know how for staying after Fajr in the Musalla and then praying after 15 minutes after the sunrise, for us it's considered Hajj and Umrah complete, complete, complete. Um, th does that apply to the wife if she stays at home and does the same conditions but just at home? Will that apply for her? Yeah. Who, who said that it has to be in the Musalla in the Masjid? Musalla, that means where you pray. Whether you pray yeah. inside the house, inside the musalla, outside on the field. So where yeah. you are, doesn't mean the yeah. masjid. Exactly. So where you are, inshallah, it will be working. But the best thing is, of course, in the masjid. A sister wants to know if it's compulsory to distribute the sacrifice into free shares. I've explained that. I said it's not really compulsory. But uh, the extreme of it is that to make it like equal shares, that's not really from the Sunnah that we know. Uh, that is, we I, I've seen some of the people, actually my grandmother used to do it. She brings a scale and she says, this is for the one part or one part. And she makes exactly leg here, leg here, or half a leg here. No, but uh, we find that, alhamdulillah, eat yourself, feed, and save. Now. Abu Farid, please. Um, Sheikh, the question is regarding Akhika. Is that okay? No. Yeah. Leave it, inshallah, for next two weeks' time, bidhanillah. Unless you have Akhika now. Yes, I do, actually. Go on, then ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, we missed um, on the... We, we did Akhika a few days ago, but... I uh, we did what? Day, the Akhika, I did it two days ago. So you've done it already? <laughs> yeah, but I missed um, one thing. Because... Um, we were so busy cutting the hair on the day. That's nothing to do with the aqiqah. Cutting okay. the hair is nothing to do with the aqiqah. Aqiqah is the slaughtering. Cutting the hair is something else. Okay, but does so it have to be done on the seventh day or can I do not, it anytime? It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be on the seventh, but it is from the sunnah to do it on the seventh. So the cutting of the hair, you could do it. It's the best thing to do it on the seventh. But if you did not do it on the seventh, do it on the eighth, on the ninth, or the tenth. Now. Isaac. Yalla. Sheikh, the Prophet Sallallahu when he said that he has had a son last last night, I think, and he named him Ibrahim. Does, is it last still, night? Last I, night? I think he said that he had the night before a son and he had named him Ibrahim, something like this, the hadith. I can't remember it fully. Yeah, um, no, no, I'm sure it's okay about last night as in last night. <laughs> no, no, the Prophet Sassan, he said that he had the day before or the night so before. So what's the question? So what is the best? Is the best to name the child on the seventh day or is this just, is permissible to name him straight away? What is the understanding? You could name the child before even he's born. So now with the machines, you could know that he's a male or a female, isn't it? You could start fighting about to name him just before he's born, no problem. So the, name, the, the, the naming is not really attached to the seventh. So you could name him before, as I said, before he's born. Jazakumullah khairan, Sheikh. That's all the yes. questions we have. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan. And actually, I've got some things to do with the cutting. And I've talked about this, cutting from the back and all of this, I think I remember. And when we talked about the slaughterings and all of this. So, subhanakallah, bihamdik. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك الله خير وبارك الله فيك.